Well, very warm greetings to everyone from pre-dawn New Zealand. I um, live in the small and beautiful university city of Dunedin, which is down on the lower southeast coast of the South Island. It's still dark here, and this morning it's wet and windy. When I got up, I lit candles and packed and lit the fire. So it's very good to be with you all this morning, and thank you, Alexander, for inviting me to share my art-making process with you and the 2025 initiative group. Um, what I'll be doing today is showing a fair number of slides, um, this being very much image-based presentation, and speaking of my recent studio explorations and the ways in which painting helps me to synthesize and deepen my understandings of the Age of Wisdom teachings and also our surrounding world traditions within the context of these threshold times. So I want to start by reading a short piece that I came across while I was doing my internet read around um, a couple of mornings ago. This was an entry on a blog that I read regularly. Uh, Anne Creelkamp is the name of the blog author. And she had reposted a piece on her site that she'd read somewhere else called into the ruins. For me, it summed up beautifully today's world situation, as many, if not most, of us see and experience it. What she wrote was this, our stories guide us. Again and again, they tell us the shape of the world. They bring order to the chaotic events around us and allow us a framework in which to approach each day. But our cultural stories today are failing us. On the one hand, they tell us tales of unending progress, of ever-increasing riches, of more energy, more resources, and the easy solve that new technology will fix any and all problems, even the ones created by the new technology. They weave narratives of the sustainability of impossibly rich lifestyles and the ability of human ingenuity and creativity to cure our ills and transcend all limits. On the other hand, they shout of imminent collapse and extinction. They tell us of runaway global warming and runaway to technological enslavement, of dystopian futures riven by impossible levels of cruelty and inequality, of overbearing world governments that crush our freedoms and an endless cascade of calamities caused by our own hubris. The mistake of these stories is their disbelief in limits. They choose a trend and extrapolate, believing that the future can only bring us more of the present. They make wild assumptions and discount negative feedback loops. They believe in human omnipotence, even as every passing year makes us look decidedly more impotent. They fail to understand human response and adaptation, flattening the incredible complexity and irrationality of human behavior into tired tropes that serve as little more than a means to buttress simplified worldviews and proffer scapegoats. In the period of dramatic change and upheaval that we found ourselves in now, these stories are dangerously misleading. They tell us of a future that will not arrive and that does not exist. They convince us that fatal stupidity is wisdom. We need new stories. We need stories that recognize the harsh limits making themselves clearer by the day, but that also see the creativity afforded by those limits. We need stories that understand the future will be hard, sometimes cruel, lacking in the abundant energy and resources we were promised, and reeling from the consequences of reckless usage of fossil fuels and the rampant destruction of unimpeded and thoughtless industrialization. However, we also need stories that see the joy as well as the sorrow in that future and all the ways that human beings will survive and thrive in the face of natural limits and harsh consequences. Human ingenuity will not solve all our problems, but it will undoubtedly create brilliant, surprising, and at times even delightful responses to the years, decades, and centuries of decline that face industrial society. It's quite 
a sobering passage. I want to share now a dream that I had in around 1994, 22 years ago, around the time that I emigrated from South Africa to New Zealand. It was a vivid dream about the Divine Mother, archetypal goddess, Isis, Mart, Mary. I want to share it with you because in both quiet and overt ways, all my creative explorations since then have been informed and motivated by this dream. I haven't yet been able to paint the goddess, but I hope to in time. She was naked, full-bodied and large-breasted, her expression one of calm focus and deep tenderness. The Divine Mother straddled the continents, her head in the heavens and her feet, her feet firmly planted on the earth. Using kelp leather and a large needle fashioned from a spear-like acacia thorn, she was lacing the edges of the coastlines together, a delicate and demanding task requiring a surgeon's concentration and to the patience of a master embroiderer. She was engaged in an act of healing and too of creativity and loving adornment. Her careful stitching bringing jagged edges and mismatched contours together to form an intricate tapestry that took my breath away. And when she came to places where the contours of land masses did not naturally fit together, she was unperturbed. Casting around for boulders, she handpicked them, great and small, from the surrounding mountain and desert landscapes, placing them, one by one, and with a mother's care, into the ocean's deep, where they became stepping stones, a magnificent and enduring bridge spanning time, distance, and difference. So that dream, together with the mantra of unification, have really been um, the containers for my years of work. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you in some form today. Just a glimpse into my studio practice and um, my, my explorations through creative media. In my studio I have this drawing, which is an old cartoon of the Mother Mary. It hangs in the left-hand side of my studio and keeps me company. And this prayer by Master Serapis Bay is one that is also of great significance and meaning to me. It's the prayer to the Universal Mother. Universal Mother, weave me in the language of love that brings me closer to loving my brothers and sisters in oneness. Grow in me my ability to think and feel and to act with a love that binds all things together in beauty and creation. So I'll go back just a couple of years to the joy and privilege of sharing a garden space with um, a beehive. Uh, my grandfather was a beekeeper and my uncle and two of my siblings beekeepers. And um, for a time I was a host to um, this beautiful hive of industrious and uh, creative winged creatures. And they taught me a lot, um, the daily observations of rhythms and, and dance and um, discipline and community and, and successful collaboration. I was fascinated by the architecture um, and the simplicity yet complexity of the hive nature. And around the same time I was exploring um, this periodic table of the world's religions and philosophical um, traditions that I came across. It was put together by a Scottish peace, uh, peace educator, Dr. Thomas Clough Daffern, and I was feeling slightly uh, chagrined, I guess, by my lack of knowledge and understanding of the world's traditions. I, I, I wonder if many of us feel that way, but I, I wanted to expand, I guess, my thinking and my uh, inclusivity of, of other traditions. And so 
this came my way. I can't remember even how, how, how I found it, but the internet somehow offered it up. And there's a link um, on, a, on a, a handout that Alexander will give um, to everyone before um, this webinar is finished. And you can click on any one of these little boxes. It's based on the periodic table of elements. There's 168 boxes uh, relating to 168 elements. If you click on any one of them, it opens up that particular world religion or philosophy. And in that box is a whole page full of the etymology of words, the uh, teachers, the uh, literature, the history. And it's an amazing resource. I hope some of you will avail yourself of it because I found it an immensely helpful tool. So using that and the template of a beehive, I handed over a wall in my studio to a large canvas. This was really prompted by the news about the Nigerian school children and their kidnapping in Chibok. A story I found deeply saddening. And um, when overwhelmed by the world situation, the only thing I know to do um, that I found helpful is to take it into the studio and into the creative work as a form of prayer. So I called this work The Hum of the Past, which was the title of today's presentation. And the first two portraits that found their way into that honeycomb were those of um, Hansatu and Tabitha, two of the girls who, who were kidnapped in Nigeria. Um, over time, I found the chambers filling with unexpected surprises, everything from the Ebola virus to atomic structures to creatures from the David Kingdom to pomegranates and Egyptian barges, science, the war machine, everything that was both going on in our environment um, as news items and um, as our unfolding story, but also those from past traditions and um, the soul's language. And I wanted to find a way to me to weave all of these uh, disparate parts together so that they form some kind of coherent narrative. It's thought very much as a map with a north, south, west and east axis, um, similar to the world maps and to the globe that we inhabit. And lines of latitude and longitude, uh, stars, the constellation of Sirius as a protector. And into these chambers every day, because it was a daily practice, um, I never really knew what was going to turn up, but you can see here that a wide range of things did. Everything from the platonic solids to Isis the mother, to Isis the extreme political faction, to the teachers, Dalai Lama, the Pope, Master DK, for the Buddha, Christ and Mary. For every dark event in the world, I sought to place a point of light surrounding that event um, to articulate the dark with triangles of light, a protective healing mantle, as we do in our triangles healing work, uh, meditation work with Lucius Trust, and two in the Ask Project that two year Michael Robbins started a couple of months ago. This is just another detail of this honeycomb canvas. I want to say just a little bit about um, Google and gadgets and social media. Uh, they are powerful instruments, of course, for the dissemination of information, for the connection, for connection through story, for building an exchange of ideas, for the distribution of love and light and a manifestation and affirmation of the global network of light. And I just want to say here a uh, thank you to Sharon and Jan and Pe Penelope and Sukitra and Risa, so many of us in this group who consistently post inspiring and hopeful messages to platforms like Facebook, um, grounding the ageless wisdom teachings in everyday language so that they become increasingly accessible to everyone, um, a common language. I too have found Facebook a very um, useful and effective tool for sharing story and um, my own learning in a language that hopefully is accessible to um, everyone, even those who do not know the esoteric language. So I started um, realizing too that the big honeycomb 
canvas that I'd been painting actually had another role, and that was that each chamber was an anchor point for a story. So I started with um, extracting the chambers and attaching them to um, news events and items and to teachings and uh, philosophical traditions and posting those to Facebook. Um, this one was the 17 goals set by the UN in 2015 to end, to end extreme poverty with a link to an article by Alex Ratcliffe. This one I posted after the Paris massacre and was struck by the words that I used to sing as a child in the Messiah from Isaiah 53, chapter verse 4. Thinking of Christ and the Masters witnessing the sorrows that we experience and the suffering down here on Mother Earth and the one line, surely, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. And that we are not alone, that we are always accompanied, especially in the darkest times. The internet makes all manner of connectivity possible. It facilitates the rapid and wide-reaching dissemination of information and provides a platform for subtle work that greatly enhances the reach of the nuclear group of world servers. It's a remarkable educational and peace-building instrument. And this is a quote from Jane Addams, an artist in the UK, who wrote, in the olden days, People carried fire nests from place to place. A spark wrapped in grass or some slow-burning textile. These became tinderboxes containing a flint to strike spark onto kindling. Fire is latent until ignited with air, the gentle breath, the alchemist's bellow or lungs. The holy fire was primordially pure and magical. In our day, we have matchboxes and lighters and and buttons, and we forget the magic. Our individual candles are lit by the one flame all over the world. The sun's star encircles and lights the world. The flame of tenderness passes from person to person. Christ has no body now on earth but ours, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Ours are the eyes through which he is to look out Christ's compassion to the world. Ours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Ours are the hands with which he is to bless men now. This is from a prayer uh, to, uh, of St. Teresa of Avila. For me, the feminine principle speaking in love to the masculine. There is, I think, a growing, even urgent call for face-to-face -face encounters, for real-life, non-virtual, physically grounding connection. We can do this via sec secular churches, networks of grace, stations of light that are physical and tangible as well as subjective, lighthouses, domestic spaces that provide safety, succor and sanctuary. We need to create meeting places for listening, and the telling of stories, and to be in daily contact with the earth and the heavens, our bare feet on the, on the earth, our eyes to the stars, in a horizontal and vertical alignment. I really love this, this quote by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who wrote, the world, this palpable world, which we will want to treat with the boredom and disrespect with which we habitually regard places with no sacred association for us is in truth a holy place, and we did not know it. Enite adoremos, which means come, let us come, let us adore. I travelled to South Africa last year in um, August, September, October for a conference and, to, and for a self-directed retreat. And I couldn't take a lot of materials and uh, art materials with me. But I decided to cut up canvas and create small individual hexagons that um, I could travel with um, and work on while I was away. So I could work on them in airports and um, in traffic and <laughs> small spaces and they could pack up easily into a suitcase and come along with me. 
I also thought there would be pieces I could distribute while I was traveling to others who might want to participate in a project that was growing, the same um, Hum in the Parts project. So I cut up these beeswax, um, these canvas hexagons, and sealed the edges with beeswax. The reason being um, for the healing properties of the wax and the vibrational potency of the hexagons. While I was in South Africa, I began stitching um, texts from uh, the UN's uh, Girls for Sustainable Development and also from um, the Pope's, uh, from Pope Francis's Laudato Si into these honeycombs. I was using a very plain lead colored thread and going about it as earnest work. <laughs> One day I was staying with friends and my friend's daughter, Robin, um, was homesick from school and um, was at a loss for something to do. And she's um, studying art as a subject for the trick. And I invited her to um, participate in the project and gave her some hexagons to stitch. And she said to me, Claire, um, would it be all right if I drew something? I don't really know that I have anything to say and um, I would love to draw. I said, of course, it'd be wonderful. And she drew these two beautiful portraits of um, imaginary friends, uh, people who she said she'd encountered in trains and at, uh, at the traffic light intersections. And she stitched these beautiful faces into the hexagon and opened up really a whole new um, adjoining room to me, um, that of image and, and fun and uh, play and delight. I was very grateful to her for that because um, I do have a tendency to be overly earnest and <laughs> um, I need to remind myself to be joyful and to delight. Benite adoramus. So I handed out these um, hexagons as I traveled and people began to stitch and write texts and words from poems, um, uh, thoughts from dreams, uh, messages of hope and delight and magic into these um, hexagons. I'm going to just show you a selection here. Um, there are probably, we probably have about 250 now, and I'm hoping they'll continue to grow into the thousands. If anyone's interested in participating, please contact me. <laughs> I would love you to contribute. So my little nephew, who's 14, in Johannesburg, stitched this tree. Um, and somewhere in the, hexagon, in the honeycomb are the words, I think I will never see a poem as lovely as a tree. It contains everything from science to domestic details to... Um, wildlife, and the heart. I realized a little way into it that the hexagons actually corresponded in size with the size of the human heart, which I thought was rather wonderful. So that the hum of the parts illustrates now our planet as a whole comprised of many hearts and many parts. Research is showing that the heart is an organ of highest intelligence and coherence. I wanted to know the measurements, so I looked it up on Google and saw that the heart, the human heart, is roughly the size of a fist. I found that unusual, this um, bringing together of polarities, the fist and the heart. We clench our fists in anger and in frustration and in fear. In today's stress and chaos, what might we do to unclench our fists and our hearts and open more fully? to love. We are so often overwhelmed during these threshold times, and I think often of Mother Teresa and this line that is attributed to her, do one small thing each day with great love. And this from Helen Keller, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. So the language of the heart is the language of beauty, it is the language of mystery, of courage, of curiosity and inclusivity. It is the language of listening, of wonder, patience, openness, honesty, attentiveness, receptivity and spaciousness. Where to start? Start here, said someone, with the red-billed oyster catchers with us those suffering in Syria. Cut down carbon emissions. Turn a fridge magnet into poetry. 
There is scarcity of water here. I wanted to include also children's drawings, those made by refugees. This is one that a Spanish child drew of life in Daria, Syria, bringing to our attention all the realities that we are facing as humanity today. I wanted also to include as many languages as possible. So we have Chinese and Zulu and Afrikaans, English. Ideally, we get all the world languages included in this project. This is how it's looking at the moment. This is a photograph of the honeycomb photographed in my studio just a few weeks ago. Uh, stitching these has become a daily practice as painting the honeycomb canvas was. It feels for me like a sacred prayer infused with love, with the love of many. It seeks to build bridges between disciplines and ideologies, between cultures and spiritual traditions. It's a document of our times, and I also see it as an altar cloth that we are creating together. I was struck one day when I was working on the hexagon, and I looked at the back of it, and I saw this strange other language, an unreadable language, but somehow a language that made sense and that was understood without my knowing it, like a semic writing. On some level, I didn't know, need to know what the backs of the hexagons were saying because I, all I knew was that they were all being written and stitched in love. And I was reminded of this uh, passage from the externalization of the hierarchy in which uh, Master DK writes, the Pentecost will become truth. All men will come under the tide of inspiration on high and though they may speak with many tongues, they will all understand each other. This image shows the back of the hexagons with this asemic writing, this writing that is communal to all of us. It fills me with hope. Many of us belong to the Triangles Network and meet regularly on Monday mornings with Kathy Newburn and her co-workers, our co-workers, to meditate and build the network of light as a protective mantle across the planet. And I wanted very much to create some kind of physical manifestation of this net network of light um, that I could identify with. It was a way of mapping constellations here, down here on Earth, a kind of mirror image, if you like, of those in the cosmos. I love Helena's uh, term, soul star groups. Our lights are always lit, so we intensify their brightness and radiation through focused thought and meditation, as in the triangles and ask work. One morning after a triangles webinar with Kathy, I decided I wanted to draw or paint the network of light onto the wall above my bed so that I could sleep in shimmering energies. I had been in town and found myself parked in my driveway googling satellite world map on my cell phone. And I found myself on a site on a Gene Keys page reading an article about a peace map. This is what stood out for me. This was written in 1913. It can be readily seen that this impartial world map may have been, may have after all no small bearing on one of humanity's most sacred ideals, namely peace on earth. The new map from its odd shape is called the butterfly map. Now the butterfly among all nations has been used as a symbol of life after death. May not this accidental similitude be interpreted in the light of a new era for mankind at large, too long struggling in mutual warfare? May it not typify a moral metamorphosis of the whole planet and the winged awakening of a world conscious whose future flight no man can now imagine. This was a comment on the Keys Cahill butterfly map. I'd never seen it before and it struck me as exquisite beauty. There were two versions. This one is what's known as the M butterfly map. And this one, which is more traditional butterfly shape. I find them incredibly beautiful. Looking at them more closely and reading through the research of these two men's, these two men's um, journey um, in, the, in the making of this map, 
their focus was actually on correcting all distortions, which is an amazing metaphor really for um, the work we do with glamours and um, the refining of the personality. I was struck by the fact that when you take the globe as they did and they opened it out into segments, they ended up with eight portions, eight graticules as they're called. There are 197 countries in the world and if you add up those numbers, the 1 plus 9 plus 7 becomes 17 which becomes 8 which is the number of Christ. I can't help thinking that somehow this is a covenant. 197 countries now at this um, during this forerunner time being equal to the number of Christ. It makes me feel um, that in some ways um, this is a promise. All will be well. All is well. This is um, an image showing the map that I am painting onto the wall above my bed, articulating the surface with lines of light. And I find it incredible to wake and sleep beneath this image um, with these potent energies. It feels deeply comforting to me in a way of connecting up with the world group um, who are ever near, ever present. And two, with the master at the center keeping watch over all things. I want to share with you briefly uh, my full moon calligraphy, which is an alphabet of light that I've created over many years at the time of the full moon. This being a very special full moon where there are two full moons um, this Gemini month, a beautiful endorsement of the Buddha-Christ relationship and two of the masculine-feminine principle. I've created a calligraphy using tracings of the moonlight, including an alphabet, which is an A to Z of moon letters that I've been um, incorporating in work um, that has to do with the nations of the world. I took the A to Z of all the nations, 197, and extracted the ATCG sequence from their names to come up with this, which feels for me like a coherent um, sequence that is unifying and poetic and that has a sound quality to it. Translated it into the moon writing so that it becomes for me a kind of manifesto of peace and of unity and of oneness. All our, our, our nations united in their sameness yet identifiable in their uniqueness. These two images that Helena and Sheldon incorporated in the Pentecost, esoteric Pentecost journey have had great meaning for me. I began a new project um, around, around about Easter time, um, also during Esoteric Easter, and continued it through this Esoteric Pentecost period. And these two images were very inspiring for me. The ones of the Holy Spirit descending to each of us as individuals and to, to each of us as nations surrounding, uh, sur around the earth. This presence of of God with us. Now, I want to try and find a way to create a, a map equivalent that it would incorporate the triangles work and the ask meditation work together with the DNA sequence of this unified world um, and uh, the feminine principle and my goddess dream and basically everything, a synthesis if you like of um, many years of exploration. So I set about mapping out these, uh, created these small templates from the butterfly map, whose um, symbol of course is the psyche and the soul and transformation. I mapped it out onto a giant canvas in the studio and took the ex extracts of DNA um, and placed them at the center of each of these map templates. So that there were 179 map templates, um, each of them carrying their relevant DNA. I then began working in inks and beeswax, again for its healing properties, and oils onto this canvas. Uh, those are the acacia thorns from my goddess dream that I found in South Africa, resting on the canvas. While I was working, uh, this paragraph that Etty Hillison, who's a peace builder, wrote, keeps coming to mind. She wrote, ultimately we have just one moral duty, which is to reclaim large areas of peace in ourselves and to reflect it towards others. And the more peace there is in us, the more peace there will be also in our troubled world. 
There have been many gifts and challenges to spending several patient months working for many hours each day on this multi-layered, slightly crazily detailed canvas. I have Venus in Virgo and a Virgo moon. It has brought me face to face with my own glamours and my gnarly bits, my unlovely shadow self. And there's been no escaping the cruder nuances of my inner dialogue. Self-forgetfulness, harmlessness and right speech are the torches I reach for and too they are the flames that scorch me. It is said that we teach what we need to learn. Being still and fully present has brought delicate surprises too. Amongst these daily encounters with tiny winged in insects. They fly in while I'm painting, landing on the maps of the different countries and traversing the ground of each place. Perhaps it's the beeswax that attracts them. I welcome them as tiny visitors from the subtle realms, glad, glad of their company as I work. They come, I think, to wake us again to wonder and miracles. So these are a few details from this, um, this large um, piece, A Song for a Unified World. Just showing some of the process. I have a way to go, yet. <laughs> My understanding is that the Holy Spirit represents the Divine Feminine, whose descent and impress on humankind during the Festival of Pentecost invokes and catalyzes a corresponding ascension of the Divine Feminine amongst humankind here on earth. So my hope is that this work will actually contain elements of this divine feminine, this upsurge of divine feminine. Um, there are birds that are being liberated from the maps. And in time, I hope to stitch this, um, the little points of light that you can see um, into a network of light that infuses this piece as, um, you know, with, with light and protective energy a mirror of the work that we're doing in the triangles and ask work. I'll stop with this image, which is again a synthesis of various images that I've shown today. And this quote from A Course in Miracles with thanks to Helena and Sheldon. This is a feast unlike indeed to those the dreaming world has shown. For here the more that anyone receives, the more is left for all to share. The guests have brought unlimited supply with them, and no one is deprived or can deprive. It is a feast the Father lays before his Son and shares equally with him. And in their sharing there can be no gap in which abundance falters and grows thin. Here can the lean years enter, for time waits not upon this feast which has no end. For love has set the table in this space. Thank you. I'll pause here. Let me just have a moment of this quiet. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Claire. And we open up now the microphone for sharing. So please share your thoughts and impressions and maybe some questions which we could reflect together. And uh, in order to do that, use the function, uh, raise your hand. It's on your control panel. And uh, I will unmute you. Or you can write your comments in the question section. Earlier 
during your presentation, Claire, there was a comment from Emmy Firstall. We interpret our own dreams from our relationship with our individual experience with nature and life. The dance of life and our collaboration with what we find with what it is, is infinite truth, infinite self, impersonal self. That's so beautiful, thank you. And yes. Um, there is a raised hand, um, and I will unmute Halina. Yes, hello, Clara, this is Halina. I just want to thank you for your beautiful, extraordinary artistry and ability to weave and synthesize and bring through the divine human in all its aspects to the, the holy table today. Thank you so much. Bless you, Helena. Thank you. And thank you, too, for the many resources that you make available to us through your work. Um, you provide us with a very rich archive, one that I dip into very regularly. Thank you. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. Thank you. It is very beautiful to sit quietly with you in what feels like a cynical, um, an upper room. Sasha? Uh, yes. Uh, so I've unmuted John Hura. John? Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Claire. This is John Horan. I wanted to compliment you, Claire, on the brilliance of your moon writing. I find that 
literally a brilliant idea to take the reflected light of the sun as transmuted by the moon and use it to create your own language I think is astounding and unifying as well the heavens the radiatory the magnetic the masculine and feminine please continue to do this our world needs it so much thank you John thank you so much it's something we can all do it's a, a beautiful full moon ritual and I have a very simple camera a point and shoot and if you just play around with the settings and you um, work with patience um, the moon offers up beautiful delights especially the full moon um, it's a lovely way to communicate with the energy so thank you for that comment hello Sheldon oh yes yes well Claire, um, you know, it's watching what you're doing and allowing it to flow through it. I'm reminded of what DK talks about in terms of the fourth ray coming in strongly in these years to come, which will bring a new kind of beauty and knitting together of, of science and art. And you are doing it. I mean, what you've done here is just extraordinary. And... Um, given the fact that we still are at the end of Pentecost moving into Gemini, this has been a feast unlike anything I've ever seen. So I did, I have to say what John was saying too, with continuing what you're doing, knitting these together by in so many different ways, it's, it's a phenomenal that we all can see the patterns and participate in the world coming into union. Bless you. Thank you. Yes, you too, Sheldon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, I saw at some point you were raising your hand. So if you still would like to share, please uh, do it again. And uh, there are a few comments. Um, Eliza says, that it's extraordinary and with some very relevant ideas for our triangle service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Celeste says, deeply moving and inspirational, Claire. Thank you so much. I wish I could share this with others, just as you shared it today. Thank you. Many as one is the word that keeps coming, the term that keeps coming to many as one. We are hold of many parts. I'm I'm looking at the image that is on the screens now and it's so deeply invocative and that's it's I think it's a reflection of what is our work to, uh, today and uh, what is our responsibility it's not just opportunity but it's a responsibility as well for all of us being together as one united as one world group parts of the bigger larger group keeping this beautiful image of world butterfly. Yes, and transformation. And in the lower part of this image, there's a tiny detail which has been uplifted from uh, Nicholas Rurich's um, Mother of the World painting, which I'm sure we all know. And I had not noticed before, because, you know, sometimes the internet crops images, but um, there is a small altar with a Greek cross or chalice placed on it right in the very foreground of the painting 
And that's so invitational and beautiful because, of course, the altar and the table represent um, the meeting place between nations, between realms, between the higher realms and the lower worlds, uh, kingdoms. A place of harmony, really, where differences are set apart. And I really love that that, that, that altar is in that painting. as an invitation to us. There is a comment from Nancy. Thank you, Claire. I feel as, I've, as if I've just attended a sacred ceremony and am awash in its magnificent, beneficent, loving energies, overwhelming peace and beauty, deep gratitude for the creative spirit flowing through you. My hand is on my heart, Nancy. Thank you. Melia says, I deeply appreciate the way that Claire surveys the world and takes what she perceives into the sanctuary of her studio and her heart to enact the al alchemist skill to change the lead into gold. Hello, dear Malia. Much love. And there are more and more um, sharings coming in the feed, uh, and uh, would be great if some of you could share them uh, through your microphone to hear your voice and your note of your soul and your heart coming through your voice. So please, there is another sharing uh, from Deet. Fantastic talk, illustrations, and your work. Thank you so much for all your inspiration you give. Love and light. Love and light, Deet. Thank you. Melia adds, that should be sanctuary of your studio. <laughs> I'm smiling. I have a que I have a question on that. It's it's one of the slides the the when what you shared there was about actual grounding the, the light and there was uh, creating the lighthouses. Uh, how do you see that? Like how because this similar idea I think hovering for many of us of creating those actual physical plain manifested points of light from the spaces of our hearts, spaces of our houses, spaces of our communities. What is what is it for you, that lighthouse, creating the lighthouse? How do you see that? Um, I, I see it first, I think, as um, in relation to the Etta Hilson quote about finding peace in our own, um, in ourselves and um, that we become um, ourselves a place of peace, which is no small task, is it? <laughs> but um, that it begins there, and that um, I love the idea of, of, you know, the home with open doors um, and um, a threshold space that people are invited to cross. And people just coming together in community for for meals or for simple creative activities. I, I, I have um, for some time held creative play workshops in the studio and create that time as a, and space as a sacred um, gathering. So there is ritual um, that, ac that accompanies those, um, those workshops. And the people who come are not necessarily esoterically um, trained or know anything about you know, the, the, the blue books or the Edges of wisdom teachings, but we we are all of us um, seeking to connect through love, and it doesn't matter from whence we come, or, or as long as the motivation is to connect and, and to do so in love. I think there are many many opportunities to be um, to be lighthouses around the planet. Mm. 
It's very true. Very I think true. it's a, a desperate, desperate need, you know, in today's world where we are so virtually connected um, and we conduct so much of our life through machines. I think that increasingly that need to anchor um, relationship in the real world um, is important. It's um, you know, a place where we share our fears and our sorrows and our joys and um, really what the old churches would do, the traditional churches would do, which is why I, you know, I, I mentioned secular churches. I think um, there is a real need for those. And to sanctify you know, and re-enchant everyday life. In a way, the, 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 it's the work of the seventh ray, the common seventh ray, it's to bring the, that note of sacred spaces into any space and into any work or project that we do, sanctifying the routine of life, so to speak. Yes, it's exactly that. I found um, having daily practices, um, that I like to think of as rhythms, you know, so that there's something kind of kairos about them rather than chronos, you know, so less fixed, more fluid. Um, but that idea of, you know, in the, in the way we have a meditation practice, um, even simple things like um, feeding the birds every morning or stitching a honeycomb or writing, you know, an intention on a piece of paper and putting it in a jar um, or giving thanks, you know, for something. And, um, Whatever it is, it, it can be very small. It doesn't need to be big, but but the energy and the and the, um, the reach of that grows through our intention. I think far more than the act itself. It's the intention. Well, it's the act and the intention. I think the two together that that um, create efficacy. I think that could be used as a recipe for magic, act and intention. <laughs> yes, <laughs> white magic. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, hi Nancy. I just saw your note, and so I'm unmuting you. Oh well, <laughs> I had written um, my message to Claire because I wasn't on. I I couldn't seem to find you, Sasha. So <laughs> I already said what I wanted to say, but um, well. Claire, I don't. I'm overwhelmed by what you've offered today, and just filled with gratitude for the inspiration you've given us in so many ways, including just what the words that you just spoke. So another thank you from the depths of my heart and soul. My thanks to you too, Nancy. Thank you. Jen Dietrich says, exquisite Claire, thank you. With you in one heart, one life. With you too, Jen. It's lovely to know you're there. <laughs> Netney says, I want to thank you so much, Claire. The experience today is so moving. Yes, you, Netney. Oh, and uh, Netni, I see you raised your hand, so if you s still have something to add, I will unmute you. Uh, I wanted to express it in words. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Claire. That was so beautiful. It's I'm lovely so to hear your voice, Netni. <laughs> lovely to hear your voice. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yes, I, I'm so grateful I was able to connect on the internet with you all and um, it's just it's like magic. It is, isn't it? I had, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was telling Sasha last night that I was explaining to my mum-in-law um, the concept of a webinar and she's in her mid-80s and um, it doesn't have that much to do with technology and 
it was an interesting exercise trying to explain to her, you know, the concept of these stations of light and that you could be, um, you know, someone could be in their pajamas in Russia and you could be in, in your office in Dunedin and someone else could be in Canada and, and you could all, you know, link up and it was like, um, you know, I described the stations of light and um, she said to me, it's like magic. <laughs> I can't get my head around it. It's like magic, and I said, "It is. It is like magic. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Yeah, it is a miracle. <laughs> it is a miracle. Aren't we lucky? And Mercury's been incredibly uh, gracious <laughs> today. <laughs> and uh, uh, Eliza from Brazil just uh, saying that give a wave, uh, like giving away from Brazil. In the other side of our beautiful planet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Beautiful. Away back to Brazil. <laughs> it's so incredible that we're all over the all over the planet, and, and you're in the same room. Wow. <laughs> That's our work of um, connectivity. We learn to be connected while staying apart. Sasha, thank you so much for bringing us all together as you do. Um, you're doing such beautiful work on behalf of us all. Thank you. Thank you, and it's it's and it's a group effort too. It's a group of uh, the, our coordination group that's doing this month after month. So I'm just a yes. voice yes, of you. the group. <laughs> but yes, to, to, con to, conti to continue this note of. Uh, uh, connectivity. I want to um, invite uh, Dot uh, to share something with us and uh, we had a conversation with Dot prior to uh, the webinar and um, um, we'll see. Uh, Dot, I've unmuted you so if you could unmute yourself um, there should be somewhere a microphone on your phone that's on the control panel of the go to webinar that you could unmute yourself it's about another opportunity yes we can hear you okay thank you alexander and claire what a joy to experience your sharing you walk the path of beauty and i want to echo heartfelt gratitude to the 2025 coordination group for providing this magnificent rhythm of connection out here. It's a beautiful expression of our ever-present interconnection. Thank you, Dot. We, I think we lost you, you for a second. Are you there? Sasha. 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 So we want to share that we have a second opportunity for meditation today. Tara Stewart and Rinzen Sherpa are leading a trek to Mount Kailash for Sagadawa. And on Saturday, May 21st at 6 a.m. Nepali time, which is 8.15 p.m. Friday, May 20th, uh, our tonight New York time, they will be in the valley at Mount Kailash in meditation and linking with all of us. So we are calling this Hearts Across Distance, as you see on your screen, uh, from Heart, from Agni Yoga. And that final sentence, this experiment of the unification of Hearts Across Distance awaits its workers. And Claire, you spoke to that so brilliantly. So we plan to take 15 minutes to be together at that exact time with those in the valley. And after alignment and recognition of co-workers uniting hearts across distance from around the world, followed by a period of silent invocation, we will say the mantra, we stand with the Christ in the fire of love to the glory of the one, and then sound the great invocation. How wonderful. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to share that invitation with everyone. 
Thank you, Dot. Uh, uh, there was for some a few seconds there was a problem on my side with the sound, so I probably my voice interrupted what Dot was saying. But I think it's a fantastic opportunity, one of those unique opportunities when we can all connect uh, in meditative alignment. And so it's um, you can see it on your screen the information about this again. So it will be in five exactly in five hours from now. So wherever you are now, in whichever time zone, in five hours from now, please link with the world servers group and with our representatives there at the, the Sacred Valley. And I think now we can go into meditation. So, Claire, so can I share my screen again? Yes. Yes. So I will return yes. the screen. Okay. Now we will, should have this opportunity. Can you see my screen, Sasha? Yes, no, uh, yes. we can see it. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Meditation. I want to say thank you again to Helena and Sheldon, who offered the original version of today's meditation to those participating in their online esoteric Pentecost journey. Helena wrote, to distribute the Pentecost energies just received on behalf of the world, we can envision a culture of peace for all the nations of the world. This is a brief but potent creative meditation in line with the white magic process to build a world we want to see and live in, a world in union. The meditation will be especially auspicious, she wrote, and fruitful if repeated during the full moon of, Med of Gemini, the festival of the Christ and of humanity, and during the Libra full moon, whose keynote is peace. So, let's close our eyes and settle into the heart of quiet. Gathering together in a circle, a light and love infused network of like minded souls joining together in unity, love, and community. All points of connection are bright and attentive receptive, listening. Imagine we are standing together, shoulder to shoulder, inside the Antakarana space, a liminal realm of heightened creative tension, potent with promise. A threshold space, bridging the higher and lower kingdoms. A place where we sense and know the presence of the Holy Ones. Be aware of any tension in the body especially in the hands and the feet. Move your toes. Unclench your fists. Allow the hands and heart to expand 
and open. In the center of the space is a vast table, an altar. We are gathered together in a deeply sacred meeting place. Imagine the scourge of war has long ago ended. A sacred ritual opening the work of the United Nations is about to begin. All the world leaders, deeply soul inspired, have ritually gathered around the table. It seats, it seats each of the 197 nations of the world. The purpose for gathering the global community is to celebrate the communion of brotherhood, the desire of all nations for perpetual world peace. In the center of the table is a large crystal chalice shaped like a bowl, filled with purest spring water rising from an eternal spring deep within the primal wells of our earth. It is a world communion chalice, signifying the vital waters of life that flow through world peace. Hovering over the chalice and into the water is a stream of potent etheric white light emanating from a golden triangle around which hover four great elders of the human race. The avatar of peace, the avatar of synthesis and the Buddha, each positioned upon a point of the triangle with the Christ at its center. The energy in the room is filled with joy, expectancy, and magical vitality emanating from the Blessed Ones. The presence of the Christ is the spiritual keynote, emanating from each and every heart. The nation's leaders are committing to the good of all their people and the peoples of all nations in the field of a unified heart made present through their love, their united goodwill to manifest the plan of God and their creative intelligence and skill in action to offer aid. Listening closely, we hear the voices of peoples of all nations sharing their stories with one another. Their questions and observations, their concerns and delights pass through the space between us. The quiet is another form of speech, an invocation an invitation to all present. Physicists have just discovered a new form of light. Whales synchronize their songs across oceans. Our planet is alive. Listen. Every created thing, living and dying, is singing. I am sad. Our mother is crying. The 
The smell of bread baking fills the cavities of the house, the body. It says, stand still, breathe deep. Kindle a flame to lighten the dark and keep all fears away. I hear the most exquisite music. It is the voices of all nationalities speaking. We thank you, small farmer. What you do is essential for the life of all. Help us to cultivate our soil so that we may be a place of beauty in which the Holy Ones can walk and be refreshed. Water, oceans, the wombs we are born from, the worlds beyond language where we can be silent and agree. Welcome the stranger. So different, yet so the same. What we look at with love looks back at us with love. Forget not that the earth delights to feel your bare feet. If you are concerned about the forest, go to the forest, sit with the forest, pay attention to what the trees are saying. Come closer. Remember, we belong to one another. A ritual celebration of unity and brotherhood begins. Love and goodwill permeate the atmosphere and condition the proceedings, resulting in supreme reverence and respect. True dialogue and deep understanding of the issues each leader faces. As sole leaders of the respective nations, they begin by recognizing one another for their nation's achievements in the past year on behalf of world good. Pledges of support are offered for each nation's needs and solutions are brought forward. World problems are surfaced and brought to solution as if one mind, one heart 
and one unified will is operating through our one humanity and our one world. Each soul leader drinks a cup of pure water from the central chalice, now magnified by the Christ and the three avatars, instilling in them the power to make all things new. The words now spoken come from one spiritual speech, and the fullness of understanding arises as each sees into the needs of the others through the language of the heart, knowing only unity, goodwill, and a true realized brotherhood of light and love. We sound a sacred om to seal and make real all we have seen and heard. Let it be done. In closing the communion feast, we and all the assembled sound the great invocation, the world prayer led by the Christ. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love, within the heart of God. Let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of man. Let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. And 
and help us to do our part. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everyone. I want to remind you about um, another service opportunity that we have, the service opportunity related to this specific solar festival. It's um, the World Invocation Day which observed every year at the time of the Gemini full moon. And uh, I invite you to join the World Invocation Day Vigil organized by uh, Intuition and Service with Steve Nation. And for that, you could, any period of the day, Great, invoca great and the great invocation every 15 minutes and it would be good if you could do it several times to create certain cycle to join the global rhythm of the sound in the great invocation and so that is tomorrow and uh, you can read about it and uh, register at the world intuition uh, no not sorry intuition in service uh, website and the uh, exact time of the full moon is um, May 21st for most of us it's tomorrow at 9 16 G p.m. GMT and you can figure out the time in your time zone and uh, just as a reminder that the, many of those sources that Claire mentioned today are available on the handout uh, section of the control panel, webinar control panel. Um, you can just click there and click the link and uh, the PDF file will be uh, uploaded to your device. And also all those sources, uh, resources will be listed on the archived page of today's webinar for those of you who listen to the recording of this webinar um, later on. And uh, our next webinar will be on June 20th. It's going to be second Gemini full moon. This year we have two Gemini full moons. And it will be with Jane uh, Johnson. The topic will be to everything there is a purpose, using meditation to find and unlock that purpose. And Jane will share with us the techniques of adjustment for negativity from the nature of the soul as an approach to looking at underlying purpose. And yet another webinar, which would be the next day after that, it will be the June Solstice Festival webinar. And following the tradition that we established uh, already within the last couple of years for each solstice, we invite an astrologer to share uh, their ideas about the moment. And uh, on this year, uh, that will be uh, our amazing friend from Italy, Antonella Nobilio, a member of the Living Ethics Community. And she will share about the cycles of the solar system towards the 2025. Apparently, there are very interesting um, cycles and correspondences uh, which 
is good for us to be aware of as we approach in 2025. And there was a question uh, related to that announcement that Dot made uh, earlier. It's about the alignment opportunity um, later today with the group that's uh, going to be near the Mount Kailash in Tibet in the Sacred Valley. So in less than five hours time, um, uh, 8.15 Eastern uh, Daylight Saving Time for those of you who are on the Eastern Coast of the America, uh, North Amer Northern America, uh, just connect subjectively for 15 minutes with the group in Kaila at Kailash and with the World Servers Group, sounding the great invocation at the end. And now as we end our webinar, let's sound together the Gayatri. O thou who gives the sustenance to the universe, yes. from whom all from things, whom proceed, things proceed, to whom all things to return, all things return. Unveil to us the faith of the true spiritual sun, hidden by the disk of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Thank you.